Good afternoon. Again, good afternoon, and welcome to the dedication ceremony for the Margot V. Berman Athletic Center. This is a special day of celebration for Hillsdale College, and we need to begin by recognizing several special guests. First, we want to welcome Frank Bierman and his guests. He's with me on the podium. <laughs> Mr. Bill Bierman will recognize his guests later in the program. Next, we have track and field, women's tennis, and volleyball student athletes and coaches with us today. I'd like to ask you to stand and be recognized. We also want to extend a special welcome to student leaders representing our campus student activities and health and wellness programs. Will this group of student leaders please stand and be recognized as well. Thank you. We are also pleased to have representatives from the construction and design companies responsible for this building with us today. Will those representatives from Wigan Construction and Design Collaborative please stand and be recognized. It is now my pleasure to introduce Lauren Grover, senior from Columbus, Ohio. Lauren is a marketing major with a French minor. She is the senior class president and a member of the volleyball team. Lauren has some comments to share with us and will also lead us in the implication in the Pledge of Allegiance. Lauren. As college athletes, we are constantly looking for ways to improve and surpass our competition. We know that the only way to do that is through many, many hours of practice. And with one gym, this has been rather difficult at times. Our athletic programs pride ourselves on dedication and discipline, and this facility will help us to live out those values. Practicing here with my team this spring has been a great experience, and I know many other teams will benefit from such an ideal space. But not only varsity teams will benefit from this arena. It allows for flexibility with occasions such as graduation, convocation, and many of the distinguished speakers we are fortunate enough to have visit Hillsdale. Recreation leagues and the overall student body will undoubtedly be more active with so many more opportunities here. It is hard to express our gratitude to the fullest extent, but I can say that this building will be a big reason for a few of my visits back to Hillsdale. Hopefully to watch the volleyball team host their first season opening tournament or a class reunion, regardless of the weather forecast. This building is helping our wonderful school take steps to an even brighter future, and we are eternally grateful. I have the opportunity now as Director of Athletics to make my own comments about the many uses of this beautiful building and what it means to Hillsdale College campus life. Uh, it will be obvious if Lauren and I did not compare notes ahead of time. Some of uh, my comments will be similar to hers, but I think that's all right. First, the Behrman Center has been designed to provide state-of-the-art space for two activities, indoor track and field and tennis. Evidence of the presence of those activities has been carefully hidden at this time, but our students who participate in track and field and tennis have had the chance to use the building this spring, and the conclusion is overwhelming. It is an outstanding space for those two activities. We held a small trial run track and field event here in the Beerman Center late this spring, and our visitors were amazed with the beauty and efficiency of the building. We expect to have several thousand participants and spectators for track and field events on our campus, in our community, and of course in this building every year. We also had the chance to host our first women's varsity tennis match 
in the spring in the Bearden Center. And the response was the same as it was for the track and field event. The tennis surface, the building, and everything surrounding the tennis event was excellent. It is worthy of note that our team won that event 9-0, I believe, against a quality opponent. So the building is off to a great start in a competitive respect as well. Next on the list of activities and events, the Beerman Center provides the college with a wonderful space for activities that you might say are on the other end of the spectrum from those just mentioned. We see at this moment how beautiful this building is when arranged for a large formal event. It is amazing that it feels open, spacious, and inviting, even as it is prepared to welcome 4,000 guests as it is now, and that it can easily be increased to 5,000 guests. The college will make great use of the Beerman Center every year for special events like commencement that, as has already been noticed, noted may take place here tomorrow depending on the weather as usual. The third general category of activities the Beerman Center will host falls somewhere between the varsity sports activities and the formal events. It is not difficult at all to imagine the entire Hillsdale College student body in this building for a special day of activities that help create a healthier, happier, better bonded community. It is also a space that will host wiffle ball tournaments, volleyball practices and games, broom ball, table tennis, and a host of other intramural and recreational activities and events. It already has become a gathering space for Hillsdale students, and that will certainly grow through time. I admit that we do not yet know the full scope of activities the Behrman Center will house, but it will be many. Because the building is so large and so versatile, it will take time to learn its full capabilities. In closing, the Behrman Center is a great blessing to Hillsdale College now and into the future, and is a reality because of the generosity of Mr. Behrman. Uh, we are reminded every day of both its beauty and its function, and look forward with gratitude to its use for many years to come. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Frank. Uh, I discovered that this is the third athletic building ever built on the campus of Hillsdale College. Uh, the first one was built in 1885, and it was the first dedicated athletic building built in the state of Michigan at a college. Uh, you probably know that uh, we're the second oldest college in Michigan and much the best. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's also true that our charter came after the third college, even though we were founded uh, before that third college, because there was a law passed under the influence of the University of Michigan back in the 1840s that there could be no new liberal arts colleges chartered at that time. So we elected one of our faculty members, governor, in 1855 and fixed that. <laughs> so the college has an old and storied history. Of course, it did great things in the Civil War. And, uh, and we were big in athletics back in the 1880s and 1890s. We used to play the University of Michigan and Notre Dame, and we often beat them. And they've been dodging us ever since. <laughs> this is the first entirely new athletic building we built since 1926 when the Stock Field House was built. And that building was rededicated in 1948 after some significant improvements. I have a program from that dedication. It's fun to look at. It was given to me by Ellie Roydhauser, who hurt herself and couldn't come today. She's, I think I saw her son somewhere in the audience. There he is. And, uh, and uh, she was there at the 1948 dedication of the Stock Field House. And that was remade in 1988 and greatly expanded into the George George Sports Complex. The Stock Field House is still somewhere in the middle of all that. And now we have built this. So just four occasions in all of our college history. And of course, athletics, for reasons I'm going to mention in a minute, is a very big thing here, as it ought to be and must be, given that human beings are constituted bodies and souls. Those two things are integrated. You'll never understand them, and you'll never make them great if you don't pay attention to both. The 
people we have to thank for this are among the dearest people we know. Uh, I'm going to mention first Cleves and Kathy Dell, who couldn't be here. Uh, their daughter is uh, that one I'm second from the end on our tennis team now. And so I'm mentioning that, the ones I know, uh, Brittany Parks is third from the end right over there. She sits right down there. She's not bad. Um, <laughs> Uh, Cleves Delk is a, is a 1986 graduate of the college. His brother Brad was a 1984 graduate. Brad played football and Cleves played baseball here at the college. Uh, Cleves is a member of the Board of Trustees now. He uh, didn't want his name on anything in here because his daughter is going to play sports in here. I can be more candid about all this since she's not here. There are no doubts there, is that correct? Um, and uh, Cleves is a, a tremendous person. They have uh, five children, uh, two of whom are here now, Morgan and Sid Sidney, and the others are not quite old enough to be here yet, but Dugan, although he doesn't hasn't fully agreed yet, will be entering our freshman class next year. <laughs> After that, there's Winston and Maverick, and they seem all signed up. Dugan is the crisis. <laughs> but his older sisters are determined, and that would be enough. Cleve started the Delft Company, in, uh, his, his, Cleve's father started the Delft Company in, in Toledo, and it's one of the biggest financial management companies in, in the country now. Uh, he and Brad were partners in that a long time. They've uh, each got their own firm now, and uh, Cleve's is a successful man, and one of the funniest, most consistent, and most generous, and most interesting people I know. A superb trustee of the college, and we are deeply grateful. He'll watch this tape, and he'll know that I made a little fun of him, of course, and he'll know that we care so much for him and all of his, and we're so grateful to him. The building is built in honor of somebody who used to run track here at Hillsdale College, and her name is Margot Beerman. And uh, when I came here this morning, I had written some things to say about her. And I discovered on that plaque over there something better. And something better was composed by Frank Behrman, I think, with the help of Nancy Johnson. And they put it in the first person. And it's simply lovely. And I'm going to read it to you. It gives a sense of her. And I will say, you can't be around Frank without getting a sense of her. He adored her. And he is a poet, a part-time practicing poet. Poets are good at no noticing details and turning them into abstractions. And uh, Frank conveys about Margot, and it shows in this. 1945, I was born Margot Verber at Lopic, the Netherlands. 1959, at age 14, upon my graduation from a one-room schoolhouse, I went to work. 1962, I moved to England to work as a governess and to study English. 1966, as a governess in Brussels, I added French to my repertoire. 1968, I learned German, working as a governess in Hamburg. 1969, returning from a trip to Yugoslavia, I met my future husband on a train. 1970, my skills with languages helped me secure a position at a foreign embassy in Bonn. In 1972, I married the love of my life, Frank Beerman, and moved to America. And I'll put those dates together for you. And, uh, it, took, it took Frank three years to do what he really ought to have been able to do in a month. <laughs> but the decisive fact is, he did get it done. 1974, with only, with only a grade school education of record, I was accepted at a community college. 1976, I received an associate's degree in accounting, magna cum laude, and returned to the workforce. 1980, at age 34, I ran my first distance race when an injured friend gave me her entry number. That makes it sound like an accident, but if somebody gave me their entry number, I would give it to somebody else. <laughs> In 1990, at Frank's urging, I pursued my lifelong dream to teach 
two children. Hillsdale College took a chance on me. I studied great books and great ideas. I spent countless hours running on the track and on the roads of Hillsdale County. And I blossomed in an environment where I was challenged to seek excellence in all things. 1993, at age 47, I graduated from Hillsdale, summa cum laude. 1994, at last, I realized my long for vocation to teach preschool. 1996, I read the 100th anniversary of Boston Marathon. 2001, my students brought such joy into my life that we decided it was time to retire. 2006, with great pride, I became a citizen of the United States of America. You can see her citizenship certificate on the plaque up there where there's also a splendid plane painting by Anna Holtzclaw Bain, a Hillsdale graduate and the best of our according to Sam Connect, who heads the art department, the best of our young painters ever. 2007, I ran my 26th lifetime and my final marathon at Boston. 2010, in my last days, Frank and I agreed that we should share our blessings with Hillsdale students now and for generations to come. With Hillsdale College, place of sound learning that inspires and directs its students to the highest <coughs> purposes of human life. I've never read a better eulogy. Never seen a person live more vividly than in that eulogy. One feels he knows how. The eulogy was produced by Frank. With some help. Frank studied chemistry, not poetry, at the University of Pittsburgh. He was a student in Europe when he got on that fateful train and met the love of his life. He was president of a company in Detroit, a subsidiary of PBS Chemicals. He learned about Hillsdale College in 1990 through his work with the Michigan Colleges Foundation. He set up an endowed scholarship for him and his wife. He loves to write poetry. He wrote a children's book. He plays a lot of tennis, and he was just claiming he's pretty good. And I saw him challenge Frank Steiner, who's also pretty good. So this fall it will be a fateful contest. We we'll invite people and sell tickets. <laughs> I'll tell you what the building is for, and then I'll say one more word about Frank. Um, the building has three purposes. It's an anti-vampire apparatus. It's an indoor playground. It's a big old, look at it, you could land a plane in here. Keep several. And because it's so big, it, uh, it means that we can come and play up here in dismal Michigan in February and March when people can't get outside. And we're going to romp, romp all over the place. And if we catch any students staying in their room, hold up, getting dark shadows under their eyes, bring them over here and make them run. And it's designed so that the light pours in, something I'm very proud of. We don't build buildings around here anymore, except they point up and they let a lot of light in. This is like the uh, Andy Town, one of the senior track coaches, wrote me a note one time about this building. And he said, uh, we don't really have any athletic buildings anywhere around here. The second purpose of it, we might well get used to use tomorrow. Uh, we need a beautiful place to have commencement when the weather is inclement, which it seems to be most of the time. <laughs> My own average after 13 years is 40% outside. And I've only achieved that very high average by taking two radical risks when it rained hard 20 minutes before and 20 minutes after commencement on two separate years. If you think about how the proud mothers and grandmothers come dressed for commencement with their high heels and their, and their lovely gowns, a sprint in the rain to the field house is not a good thing. <laughs> but I was prepared to risk it because I don't like to have commencement in a place that looks like a basketball game is about to break out at any moment, as much as I like basketball. So we have designed this so that it looks like that. And these banners, which are lovely, tonight will be turned over. 
on the other side of them are images of statues on the campus, Washington and Socrates and Lincoln, and, and uh, the mission statement of the college. And it will look like a place where you might want to have commencement. We're going to put some big screens up right there, so you'll be able to see everything very well. And all the mothers will be able to see their children and their dads. We'll get to see the their kid get their get their uh, diploma over here and get their picture taken with me over here. And you'll be able to see the speaker and hear, and it will be comfortable in here. I want you to know how much a blessing that is. I want Frank to understand it because commencement what a college does. It prepares people for their lives. It's uh, only useful in an undergraduate college to teach things that are permanent and elevated. Because narrow or immediately practical things are not of any use to people of that age. And when you say that by combining them, they already commence all the practical things. They should do that in a place that looks like that should go on. The ceiling should be high. The light should come in. You should be able to see and hear. We've never had that in 170 years in Hillsdale College. We do today. The last purpose is also the first purpose, and that's athletics. And athletics here ties to the others. The building takes its size and part from the need to build a wacky, huge track so you can have wide turns. As I said up there, so that Everybody gets a little faster. Uh, athletic director Drew Baker, after I said that out there, pointed out to me the dismal fact that it's faster for the opposition, too. <laughs> and I said I was going to get the architects to look into what we could do about that. <laughs> but it makes you feel good you know, to run on such a place. And it has to be huge for that. And then it's got these tennis courts in the middle. And we've become very good at tennis now. Because we, you know, I am actually the person who abolished the tennis program at Hillsdale College and did not want to match in 12 years. And I thought, that's easy money to save. And now we brought it back and we have a facility for it and we've got some players and they can play. So excellence in athletics matters and athletics is competitive. In athletics they keep score and they keep score in a hurry. And you find out about yourself. It's a model for life. But also it connects to these other serious purposes because human beings are so contrived that what happens in their souls affects their bodies and what happens in their bodies affects their souls. And they're even getting away from it. Great athletes always have splendid characters if they can sustain them. And splendid characters are often physically very competent. Our athletic mission statement, which I'm very proud of, have to write, is going to be read by everybody who comes to compete right over there on that banner, and that's always going to be up along with the mission statement of the college. And that means when hundreds and thousands of students come here to play ball and compete, they're going to see that and they're going to wonder, wonder why there isn't something like that up where I play. If they're serious people. And if they're not serious people, they might be made a little more serious. And I will read it to you. Hillsdale College was founded in 1844 with the purpose to develop the minds and improve the hearts of its students, a reference to the moral and intellectual virtues. The driving purpose of athletics at Hillsdale is to cultivate those virtues. Their practice on the field of competition inspires and elevates the minds and characters those who compete and those who watch. You see what that means? It means that Frank has helped us build something to do what we do here and to do it better. And it is just the case that the things we do here when we do them well are the very best things that human beings can do. And the building in its three purposes brings together all of those highest elements of human existence, and it can be a place where those are practiced and displayed. The fact that that is what the building is for, and the fact that it comes from a generous, high-minded man, moved by the love of a beautiful woman,
makes it simply perfect. And we are so grateful to Frank and Margaret. Please. others that, uh, that contributed to this facility, and I was particularly pleased that Dr. Arn mentioned the Delt family who had a critical role uh, as a partner in this whole thing. So many people, even though Margo's name is out front and it's being called the Beerman Building, you got to call it something, I guess, but, but many, many people had a role in putting up this fine facility, and I'm just happy to be part of that, that team that uh, brought it to reality, and quite honestly honored that, that Margo was honored because she has a rather unique story to attach uh, to the building and hopefully the students for years to come will uh, study her story that, uh, that Larry read in her biography and enjoy it. All I can say is, wow, is this, is this a magnificent building? Um, but I'm sure most of you recognize that it's not buildings that make great institutions. It's about the people who have passed through here before are here today in terms of administration, students, graduates, professors, and the people who will come here in the future. That's what makes for a great institution. And I, I'm here today because I believe Hillsdale is such an institution. This is a very special day for my family and my friends and my extended family on Margo's side, represented here today from the little Dutch village in, of Loki in the Netherlands, uh, is Margo's sister, Ellie and our niece Marielle, and why don't you two stand up if you would. I told Ellie she was going to have to. They're really the other half of my family, even though they're, they're over in the Netherlands. I love them all dearly. I'm just, I'm just delighted that they, they flew over from Amsterdam the other day, and I met them at the Detroit airport. I'm just, just delighted that they could be here and, and see what is going on and they can go home and tell all the other people in the village of Lothique about the Hillsdale College. Uh, I'm also happy to have people uh, express my thanks to stateside people, and maybe I'll ask all of you to stand at the end, but uh, Barbara DuPont is a dear friend, uh, her husband, her late husband, he and I would run 6, 10, 15, 20 miles every morning for like 10 years in a row, and Barbara and her husband Tom had a a large boat and we used to go boating on the Great Lakes every summer uh, for weeks at a time and I think I suspect that we were invited to go with them we were the only ones I think that they ever invited to go boating with them and it's probably not a tribute to my compelling personality of wanting to get involved in things it was really probably about Margo that Margo was shy she was quiet she was a hard worker and you could be locked on a boat with Margaret for three weeks and never know she was there. She was, she was a joy to go boating with. Her. And uh, Barb, thanks for being here. And the next to them are Dick and Lucy Peacock. And Dick ran one of the other companies that I was associated with in Detroit. And Lucy is probably the best cook that I know. And Lucy and Dick have three children. And since Margo and I had no children, there was many, many times for either Thanksgiving or Christmas. And they lived about a mile away. They would very graciously invite Margo and I had come over for, you know, a special meal, and I know their kids very well, and they've been, and I've probably played golf with Dick Peacock more than, I'm going to tell one aside, uh, one time Dick invited me to play golf with him, I think it might have been 4th of July, and we decided to have a bet on a dollar a hole, and Dick's game is a lot better than mine, and now that he's retired, he's going to get even better, but, uh, so he was giving me some, some extra strokes, but. The bottom line was that I won all 18 holes. <laughs> and the last one, $18. And at the end of the day, he called up Margo and he said, come on over to the club and even bought dinner. So I say, that's a, that's a real friend of a lifetime. Thank you, Dick and Lucy, for being here. Next to them are the Steiners, Professor Frank Steiner and Pam. And I've known them for years. And when Margo was here and she was student teaching, uh, when the academy, I guess, was in it, so they had trailers right over here somewhere, and uh, Margo taught school with Pam, and they were they were close for years, and that was a very very special relationship. And it's nice to see nice to see them here. And in fact, I was reminded whenever I come to Hillsdale and they do the, the Pledge of Allegiance, which is obviously very important. Uh, every time I stand up at Hillsdale and do the Pledge of Allegiance, I'm reminded that when Margo was teaching with Pam here. 
their tradition is to one of the teachers to lead the Pledge of Allegiance every morning with the students. And somehow, even back in the early 1990s, Margaret was not a citizen. Uh, her English was excellent, obviously, but uh, she was called upon to lead the Pledge of Allegiance and she <laughs> never recited it. Uh, and she called me at home in, in Rose Point with a desperation to say, please, so we can write out this Pledge of Allegiance. And, and she survived quite well, but it was, it was funny for her. A Dutch girl leading the Pledge of Allegiance, but she really didn't know it. She probably had cue cards or something. But uh, Pam and Frank, nice to see you. And next to them are Barb and Al Eisenegger. And Al has worked, worked for me probably for 15 years or so, uh, has become a lifelong friend. And even though I've been retired for 12 years, Al and Barb still stay in touch with a great degree of loyalty, even though they live far away. And uh, it's a pleasure to have friends of that type to show up today. And maybe all those people can kind of stand up for an acknowledgement. Thank you for coming. A few weeks ago, I was watching the movie Lincoln, and maybe a lot of you saw that, or you know that it was nominated for Best Picture, or the Best Actor, and I think, I think maybe even Daniel Day-Lewis won Best Actor for it, and it was, uh, but it was a rather, you know, you really had to like your history to muddle through it. And as I was watching it, there was a lot of interplay with President Lincoln trying to pass the 13th Amendment. And he was always twisting and, and bribing senators to vote for the 13th Amendment. And because not many people in the Senate, uh, really because half of the Senate were Southern sympathizers, etc. So he was having a lot of trouble passing the 13th Amendment movie at least, and whether it's historically accurate or not, I'm not sure, but uh, I was going to ask Dr. Calvert, but he's ancient history, so he, he cut it way short of the Civil War, so I haven't, haven't had a chance to ask an expert, but anyway, Lincoln really was wrestling with this issue, and I was caught up in a kind of a personal intellectual debate over the proper course of action, weighing two possibly conflicting uh, moral imperatives, ending our Civil War earlier, and perhaps cutting off, you know, the, the, some of those battles were just terrific. The people were dying. Uh, but the other thing that Lincoln was trying to do was get enough votes in the Senate to abolish slavery permanently. And I got thinking, actually going back in my history, the Emancipation Proclamation, I think, had already taken place. And I'm not trying to get the history lesson because of But I, I think that freed the slaves that were in existence at that time that the 13th Amendment would have permanently abolish slavery as an institution going forward, and Lincoln was committed to that. So, at least the movie implied that, that he allowed the war to continue because he knew that if the war ended, the issue of slavery would be over and, and he wouldn't get the votes to, to approve slavery, right? So I was debating what I would do in those circumstances. And it's always, it's always easy to win intellectual debates when the opponent is yourself, you know? <laughs> You could sort of work your way through that, but it occurred to me that there are people here at Hillsdale that probably are experts on that, and the next time I come to Hillsdale, I want to explore that. Um, and then it, I reflected on the fact that Hillsdale College, as Dr. Arnold suggested, dating back to 1844, that it was well established before the Civil War, and people here on campus, most likely back then, fostered such a debate in real time. And I can almost guarantee that that happened because this was even going back that far was a place that, that stimulated intellectual curiosity, debates about great moral issues of the time, and that's what Hillsdale is. And I can say with some confidence that that was a fact because over a long period of time, this institution's guiding principles have not changed. For all of that time, Hillsdale College has been teaching people to think about the great issues of the past so that they might bring bright and open minds to solving our present and future questions of government and of moral compass. Today we are gathered here to dedicate a building in the name of Margot Beerman class of 1993. Now why does this building have Margot's name associated with it, you might ask? And I'm sure somewhere out there Margot is looking down and saying, Francis Beerman, what are you doing? Why do you... She was shy. She, was, she would not be happy with that. Lucy and Margot, you know, uh, she would not be happy with her name outside the door, but, uh, but she would be very happy 
with what is resulting from our mutual efforts of saving our money over the years and our running for mayor is for 40 years. But on our journey through life and perhaps inspire future generations of students who come here. And just very briefly, she was born around the end of World War II when her family had a German officer living in their house as part of the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands. So it was not, not easy times. And as uh, Dr. Arndt said, she got out of school at age 14, I think in the little village of Lopi, which is now a lot larger. Um, they called her in and said at age 14, you know, we can't teach you anymore. And they sent her off to work. And at first she just wanted to stay home and her father found her a job in the next village uh, in a bookstore. And, and uh, the rest goes on where she eventually did all those governance jobs and so forth. But moving forward in the interest of time, she married me. And eventually she got accepted here at Hillsdale College at the age of 45 with the goal of teaching preschool children. We had no children of our own. And one time we were sitting around and at age 45 she said, you know, I, I really always wanted to be a teacher of young children. And I said, you know, this is America, anything is possible. And, and somehow uh, Hillsdale took a chance with her, with her interesting background. And she was obviously smart, but probably she was more diligent and studious and determined than she was, uh, you know, intellectual. Uh, she would just like run, you don't run 26 marathons without uh, toeing the line and just getting out there and, and she never failed to finish her one. Um, so she was that, and graduating uh, summa cum laude was just a, a wonderful story. Uh, and she went on to be a, a preschool teacher and stayed in touch with Pam Steiner as she was teaching, as Margaret was teaching school. And during this time period, she really started excelling in running after she left Hillsdale and became a, she, I used to have to struggle to keep up with her as Barb knows. Uh, and we ran many races together all over the world and, and she just had a wonderful time. She loved running and also because it was, it was sort of a solitary endeavor that, you know, when you're out running in marathons, you're running against your training and, and uh, you know, what you think your best effort is. And that's. That's part of what I think going here to Hillsdale College, everybody knows what their abilities are, and I think Hillsdale creates an environment that fosters everybody to be running as hard as, as their talents and efforts allow them to do. In fact, Dr. Calvert and I were talking about that with the academy yesterday, that all different levels of students come to that wonderful institution. Some of, not all of them are A-plus students, but if everybody works hard, uh, that's, that's what life's all about. Finally, when I was speaking here last May at the groundbreaking ceremony, uh, Dr. Arn at the end turned to me and he said, Frank, the poem, I should have read the poem. And I kind of, I guess, yeah, maybe, maybe I should have. So anyway, the poem, uh, and this is somewhat personal, but a few days after Margo passed away, and I live in South Carolina, and I have a, a boardwalk that goes out to a dock that looks out over salt marshes and tidal flows and egrets and blue herons and it's very serene and, and peaceful. And I was sitting out there and I'm sure uh, everybody will go through this sometime in life when a loved one passes on and maybe you know a lot of you have already done that but uh, you, there's a time when you sit back and you think, gee, you know, she was, she was here a couple of days ago. And as I was looking out her there's peace and serenity, I thought that she'll always be here, uh, just not physically. And as I looked out over the, the serenity of the, uh, the salt marshes and saw these birds flying by and so forth, I sort of uh, visualized her continuing on in spirit and that, uh, you know, years from now I'd walk out on the dock and I'd kind of just feel her sense of being there and, and, uh, and give me a sense of remembrance of, of the life we shared. And a lot of the poems I write, I, it sort of almost becomes spontaneous. I, I have to labor over them and change words and so forth. It becomes mechanical and I crumble them up and throw them away. But uh, anyway, at, at uh, Larry's suggestion, I, I, uh, I didn't write this poem on Larry's suggestion, but I'm going to read it. Um, and I entitled it Songbird. A beautiful bird flew into my life, and very quietly she decided to stay. But seasons change and our lives rearrange and now she has flown away. She sang a special melody to my soul and to my heart. The song will last forever, even though she must depart. And I held her oh so softly as she quietly sang to me, it's a song I'll always remember 
long after I set her free. Many years from now, I'll awake at dawn with a memory of time that is gone. And I'll turn my ear to the morning mist and I'll hear her beautiful song. Thank you, Larry, for asking me to share that today. Finally, thank you, Hillsdale College, including Dr. Arne and his staff, uh, Don Brubaker and his group of coaches that I've met many of them. In fact, uh, Nikki, the tennis coach, she's so young, and I, I asked her what position she played on the team. I thought she was still a student. But <laughs> the, the likes of each other, Nikki, and uh, I'll come back 10 years from now, and I won't make that mistake. Uh, uh, John, John Servini and his team, he had countless people staying in touch with me and helping with the uh, design of the, uh, the entrance place over there. Uh, all of you guys have given me another way to remember Margo. And I think that she did her very best at whatever talent she brought into this world. And hopefully her story and her memory will be an inspiration to future graduates here to do their very best with whatever talents they are given in life. Thank you all for attending. I appreciate it. Peace be to this place and to every soul who shall come in and go out from it. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, as we gather in your sight to dedicate and ask your blessing upon this Margot V. Bierman Athletic Center, we pray it is pleasing to you that we dedicate this effort and result to your eternal purposes and to the purpose of this Christian institution of higher learning. As we set it apart, we implore your infinite blessing and protection on it and on everyone who shall utilize this place. Grant that those who do may be brought into an ever closer redemptive relationship with you. This we pray in the name of Jesus, who is Lord and Savior. Amen.